on this, <coughs> on this beginning level allow us to start with the broad principle that life is something which can be developed and which we must develop. Some people don't think that they're able to develop themselves and so they they think they can depend on some God to develop, do the developing for them. This is very mistaken according to Buddhist principles. For in Buddhism, we understand that we can develop and that we must develop ourselves, by ourselves. Actually, God can be understood in, in two ways, in two meanings. There is the God that is a person, a personal God. And then there is the God which is not a person. The first kind of God, the personal God, is one that has experiences like a person does. Whereas the second kind of God doesn't have experiences in a, in a personal way. Now, at some times in human history, people are, oh, and this second kind of God, we would call the law of nature. But in some times, some times of human history, people are unable to understand what we mean by the law of nature so that in such times it is necessary to talk in terms of a God which is personal, which experiences like a person or an individual would. But whether we speak of the personal God or whether we speak of the non-personal law of nature, whichever kind of God we're talking about, that God cannot develop us. Instead, we have to develop ourselves by ourselves. Whatever way we look at it, this life is something that has been given to us by nature, or by God, or by nature. We can see this life as being similar to some basic capital with which is given to us in order to invest. We invest this life in some kind of business. And then we carry out that business in order to turn a profit. If we understand life as this basic stake or capital for us to invest in our, in the business of life, then we can understand the importance of developing this life. Why do we, why do we talk about life as a kind of business? We use this, this terminology because we have the possibility of making the highest profit, receiving the most value and benefit from this life. Life all by itself, just mere, mere life, may not have any value at all or have only very little value. However, if we, we do our investment properly and then learn how to make the most profit and receive the highest value from life, then we can truly call it a kind of business, meaning that we, we try to get the most from our basic initial investment. From ancient times, people in India have used this, this word business in reference to life. They have the word sangvohara, which which means to a kind of buying and selling, a kind of trading. 
or to operate a business in order to make a profit. And the idea is that one lives, one lives one's life and looks at it as a kind of business where one tries to get the most out of it until one is old and then we turn over the business to our children in order to then experience a peaceful and wise old age. This, this meaning is an ancient one in India and it's something which ought to be of interest to us today. So we can either talk in terms of business, the business of life, or we can talk about developing life. But either way, the meaning is basically the same. We have to do something so that there is increasing value in life, so that we get the highest return from life. And so it's necessary for us to develop this life. So what is the, the benefit or the result of this, this business of life, this development of life? First we can say, the first result is a life that is cool and peaceful. And then second, a life that is beneficial and useful for everyone. If we realize these two results, then we can say that we have received the highest possible profit from our lives, the highest kind of profit which we ought to, ought to achieve. This is the result. This is what ought to be the result of the business of our lives. So to have a life that is, that is happy and peaceful and then beneficial for everyone concerned, that ought to be enough, shouldn't it? This ought to be sufficient for us. But nowadays people don't seem to be, to be satisfied with just a simple, peaceful, cool life that is of benefit to everyone. Instead of just settling for a peaceful bliss, people are interested in all kinds of luxuries and excess materialism and consumerism and all kinds of things like that. This is because people aren't interested in a truly cool, calm, and peaceful happiness. And so they go and develop all kinds of materialistic pursuits and activities. All the development is merely material. And then in this way, or, and then this kind of development completely misses the point of what we need in life. For example, all the all the things going on, all the activities that are just chasing after material, sensual kinds of pleasures, just trying to accumulate possessions and everything. This completely misses the point of what, what our lives are really about. And so then we can never really find a true peace and happiness. This, this genuine peaceful bliss that we're talking about is neither positive or negative. But nobody is interested in such a thing. All that people want is what is positive, 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 positive. And so they can't understand what real happiness, real peace is about. But here, this is what we're most interested in. The kind of real happiness that is free of both positive and negative. And this is the kind of happiness, the kind of peace that we can understand, that we can discover through the practice of mindfulness with breathing, which you are
beginning to practice here. Please be particularly interested about the meaning of these words, positive and negative, especially being free of both positive and negative. The positive excites, it stimulates, it bubbles, it, it stimulates the mind. And then the negative deflates, depresses the mind. One, the positive leads to getting happy and, and feeling happy, whereas the negative leads to sadness and sorrow. Neither of these are peaceful and neither of these are true, true happiness. So please be very careful to understand what is meant by the positive and the negative. Because if you can't understand this, you won't be able to understand what it is we're talking about here. The thing that we're most interested in, which makes, which satisfies us, which makes us happy, is merely this thing we call the positive. This is what we're familiar with. This is what we want. And then because of that, the, the negative goes against our feelings. It grates on us. We, we don't want it. We want to avoid it. Neither of these are genuine peace and, and happiness. In fact, both of them are, are the opposite of being at peace. And so to, to understand genuine happiness, real happiness, we need to understand what it is to be free of positive and negative. We can take the mind itself as the basic standard or principle, the mind that is neither positive nor negative. By this we mean the mind that neither likes the positive nor hates the negative, the mind that is not caught up in either one. This mind that is free or empty of the positive and the negative is a mind that is truly at peace and is genuinely happy. So take this mind, this genuinely happy mind that is neither positive nor negative, as a basic standard for our further understanding. Anapanasati bhavana, the cultivation of mindfulness with breathing, that which you are practicing now, will help you to know the mind that is neither positive nor negative. So please be very interested in this practice in order to discover this mind which is genuinely happy. Anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, can help us to have a mind that is pure. Anapanasati can help us to have a mind that is free of the positive and the negative, a mind that's free of any egoistic feelings, free of any sense of, of I, and mind. Anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, will help us to realize the fact of not-self, that everything in our lives is not really a self. And it will, so it helps us to give up the, the feeling, the delusion, or the belief in I and mind. This is how Anapanasati will enable us to, to be free, to have a mind that is void of ego and selfishness. But now we don't take the mind to be the basic factor, to be the, the primary issue. Instead we take I, me, myself, the ego, to be the primary issue issue and then we act in all ways from an egocentric position. When this happens then the mind has already been deceived, the mind has been tricked and now misunderstands. So 
such a mind is caught up in an illusion, in the deception of the belief in ego, in an independently existing I, in the <coughs> belief that there are things which are mine. This mind that is trapped within ego views is a mind that cannot be developed. So instead of getting trapped in this illusion, go, go straight for that, the mind itself. Don't get sidetracked by ego and take the mind as the basic primary issue, because this will enable us to, to develop life. So we need to be free of all egoistic concepts whatsoever. We need to abandon every kind of egoistic concept. That means that this we, we, under, we talk about, has to be a, a we or an I that isn't trapped in any egoistic perspective. And so this gives rise to the rather strange sentence that we need to have a we that is not we. A we that is not we is is we that has nothing to do with these egoistic concepts and delusions. This is what is necessary in life. So there is the, the we that is associated with egoistic concepts, and then there is the we that is not associated with any egoistic concepts. These two kinds of we are are so different that they're, they're even more different than if they were opposites. The difference is even more than being just opposites. The, the we that is free of egoistic concepts is just a mind that is, that is pure. The mind by itself. A mind that is intelligent, open. A mind that is free. The we that is caught up in egoistic concepts is a mind that is foolish, a mind that is deceived, a mind that is full, filled with selfishness and, and brings about all kinds of foolish and selfish acts. The difference between these two we's is immense and you need to understand that difference. This we that is full of egoistic concepts is the we that we've got right here and now, this we that's sitting right here. Whereas the we that is free of any egoistic concepts is the we that will happen sometime later. This we that has no egoistic concept is the we that will happen when life has been developed to the fullest extent is when we've reached the end of the development of life and then there will be this we that has no egoistic concern. And so there's this we that we've got now, the one caught up in ego, and then the we that we will come to if we practice Dhamma to its fullest, the we that has no ego or egoistic perspectives attached to it. The we that is not, the we which is not we. When we listen to this, it may sound like nonsense. But in fact, in this statement, there is tremendous sense. It makes perfect sense. It points to <coughs> a reality that is that is correct and appropriate. This is something that is very important for us to understand. It requires our attention to understand this we, which is not we. If we understand this, we'll understand what, what the goal of our life is. This this phrase, the we which is not we, is something which is difficult to listen to. 
and there's nothing about it that really encourages us or invites us to pay attention. But still, we need to give it total attention to understand what we mean by the we which is not we. We're talking about just this mind. If we see this we which is not we, we'll just see pure mind, mind that has none of those egoistic concepts or beliefs. This is something of great importance. The we, which is we, is the we of ignorance. The we which is not we, is the genuine we, the we of wisdom. This we that we talk about doesn't really exist. There's nothing really that is us or ours. But this is the nature of language in our world. In our languages, we have these words and we need to use them. And because of our ignorance, we don't understand the inherent falsehood and limitation of these words, we and our and us. And so we're deceived by them. We really believe in them. And then so we think that there really is a we which is we. And we don't understand that we is not really we because we're deceived by this. We, we believe in these words too much. So we must understand how language works so as not to be tricked by it, not to believe everything that we hear. The Buddha and all enlightened beings use the word we. They use these, these everyday words like we and I and ours and so on. But when a Buddha or an enlightened being used the word we, they meant the we which is not we. But when ordinary thick ones like ourselves use the word we, we mean the we that is we. And we're tricked and deceived by this. So please hurry up and understand this matter, understand the we which is not we. Understand what we're talking about here in order to be, to be free and to have a, your own experience of the we which is not we. So we ought to understand where this, this we comes from. This we comes from a misunderstanding, a lack of knowledge, um, a wrong view, and being deceived. This we comes from what we call upadana, which is grasping and clinging at things in a foolish way. When we have experience in life, say, when we have sensual experience, which is just a basic part of life, we see something or we hear something. And this is a, a rather crude and coarse stimulation of the mind. And when the mind doesn't understand this activity of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or whatever, then it misunderstands it and is deceived. When the mind misunderstands our experiences, the senses, and what we, we see and hear, then it takes these things to be we, or ours, or I, or mine, or ego. And so there arises this, this foolish clinging to things, this, this stupid attachment, because we don't see things the way they really are, and so we take them to be really we. Really, there's just a kind of an experience, a certain sensitivity of the mind. But then we misunderstand this and are de deceived into our foolish belief in we, in ours. We are able to examine this, this matter from the very start. We can go back to the beginning when we are, when we are infants. 
Or we can go back to the, the infant, the newborn infant, who born into the world begins to have the sense organs develop. And then when these are sufficiently developed, they receive stimuli. They, they make contact with various things in the world. And then through the process of experiencing sights, sounds, smells, odors, touches, thoughts, memories, and so on, these various experiences have a kind of feeling color to them. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant, some are in, indiscernible, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. And from this feeling, then there arises a desire, a want, depending on the kind of feeling. The mind wants something in terms of that, that object that is experienced. And then once there is this wanting, this desire in the mind, then there develops a sense of the, the we who desires, the desirer, the wanter. Notice that first there's just the want, the desire, but then there develops the wanter, the desirer. This is very important because this idea of the we who wants or the I that desires, it's just an illusion. It wasn't there in the first place. This I, this we, didn't, didn't exist from the beginning. But because of these various developments, there eventually, or at one point, arises this illusion, this image, this picture, this belief, identity, of we, of I. But notice it didn't exist from the start. It just developed because of there being desire. First there is desire and then the illusion of the desirer. So this is how the we arises. And it's important to see how it never, it didn't exist from the start. It only is concocted later. And it's just an illusion, an, an hallucination we create. Let's examine this, this further when the, the infant has grown. There's now a child that can walk. And the child walks and then clumsily bumps into a chair. And then the child gets angry at the chair. The the child regards the pain that is experienced in bumping into the chair. This is taken personally as my pain or I hurt. And so, as we've just explained, the child creates the illusion of we. It, it views itself as a self. And then it gets angry. It gets angry at that chair it not only has foolishly created a self-concept for itself, regarding itself, but the child also develops a self-concept regarding the chair. It, it, it sees the chair as a self. It gets angry at the chair and goes, the kid even kicks the chair. This is how this foolishness grows and expands, beginning with we see ourselves, as a self, as we. And then we go and see everything around us as selves. And so we get lost in this, this illusion, this illusion which we create. And then further, the child is even taught to get, to sink more deeply into this illusion. When the child bumps into the chair and gets hurt and angry and then sits and cries and sulks, then the nurse comes by and goes and gets angry at the chair too and hits the chair, kicks the chair for the child. And so this way the, the child's nurse goes and teaches and fortifies this sense of ego teaches the child to become even more stupid, 
to believe even more fully in this this hallucination, this deception. So this is how through we we learn, we teach each other to get more and more trapped in our illusions. In in the West, are there such practices, such customs, where the nurse will go and hit the chair or whatever for the the child which is crying? If you've got such practices back in Europe or America or wherever, then then you're just teaching your children to be more and more stupid. And so the deception grows and grows, the illusions get worse and worse. But never did this self really exist. At no point is this this belief in self, belief in something that truly exists. This self is just created out of ignorance. It's just a product of our ignorance and our lack of understanding. And so this illusion begins with the child, the young child, and then it grows. And then it's supported and fortified and solidified by customs and culture and education. And so we become more and more foolish and more and more trapped in this deception so that we're living in it all the time. We spend all our lives caught in this, in this ignorance and this deception. And then there's a second matter as well. The first matter is this, this we, this self, this ego we, we invest so heavily in. And once this, this self has been produced, has been produced fully, by ignorance, then anything that comes into contact with this self, anything that gets <coughs> into some relationship or association with this self becomes mine, the, that which belongs to the self, the possessions, the belongings of self. So there are these two things. First, the fundamental problem of I, And then from that there arises mind. Now the principal problem is the first one, this I, which is created by ignorance. And then the problem grows, expands, and starts pulling in all these things to be mine. And so this problem spreads like a cancer all over the place. Both of these, both self and that which belongs to self, I and mind, both of these need to be gotten rid of. The way to do so is to get rid of the basic one, to get rid of self. If we get rid of this illusion of self, then the illusion of mind, of possessions, of belongings, will disappear as well. In mindfulness with breathing, the practice in the, fi- the final stage of this practice is exclusively concerned with eliminating the illusion of self, getting rid of this self and with it the burden of mind. And so this is why we practice anapanasati, in order to be free of this burden of self and that which belongs to self, in order to know the we, which is not we. And then this, this, this foolishness of, of mind, of that which belongs to self, this gets even worse as well. At first there's just the mind that, that is pleasant, that we like. At first we, we, take as our belongings the things we like, the things we want. But then this feeling of mind goes, goes further and we start to feel this way towards things we don't like, things that 
that we disagree with, things that we, we hate even. And so then we end up with my enemy, ego's enemy. And so this problem of I and mine turns into positive and negative. The positive is sometimes the feeling of mine is towards the positive. Sometimes we identify with the positive. And then this foolishness goes so far as for us to identify with the negative as well, to identify with that which I hate, I don't want, I don't like, and so on and on and on. And so our mind is is dimmed and obscured and messed up. It floats around in this this confusion of positive and negative. This this positive and negative goes on and on and on. The mind's lost, flowing along, drifting in this this cloud of confusion. In the Pali language, the language which the Buddha spoke, there is the word atta and the word ataniya. Atta means self, means self. And ataniya means concerned with self or associated with self, related to self. So there's atta and ataniya. We could translate these as I and mine, but that's not really strong enough because atta and ataniya are a little bit more ugly than that. We're talking about ego and that which ego grabs onto as its own. We're talking about we and ours, I in mine, ego and my go. You, you can't have just me. You can't have just we, ego, self. Once there is atta, then there arises ataniya. As soon as we have a sense of self, then there are all the things concerned with, connected to, associated with self. And so there's I and mine, I go and my go, on and on and on. And we can't just take the positive. This Foolishness gets so carried away. We're, we're so stupid that we get, we take the positive, the negative also. This atta and ataniya, it's not just the good thing. We also get stuck with the negative, the so-called bad things. This is how this, this ignorance grows and grows in it until it becomes an incredible stupidity and how we get trapped in all this I in mind, we and ours. So now you will understand how the positive and the negative depends on mine, which in turn depends on I. Now you can remember from the beginning that genuine happiness cannot occur when there is positive and negative. So if we want to be free of the positive and the negative, we must get rid of its sources. The positive and the negative arise from ataniya, from mind, the sense of possession, of, of claiming things as mine, as ours. And then this arises from atta, the sense of self, the illusion of self. So if we want to get rid of this positive and negative entrapment, then we have to get rid of that mind. And this means we have to destroy the self-illusion. So to get free, we have to deal with this basic illusion of self. And so this is why we take up vipassana. Vipassana is seeing clearly into the nature of things. We practice vipassana in order to see clearly that the self doesn't really exist. And if we, if we understand this fully, if we experience this deeply, then the illusion disappears and then we're free of the whole mess. 
when the mind is totally liberated from positive and negative through the destruction of this this ignorant illusion of of self when we've accomplished that when the mind is totally free of self free of selfishness free of po- free of positive and negative then that mind is is very cool it's totally peaceful it's empty of of all defiling things it's totally free and liberated nothing disturbs it this this is a mind that contains within it all which is truly desirable and such a mind is realized achieved attained by the elimination of this self illusion and the sense of possessiveness of mind that it engenders and then the positive and negative that arises from that that's all there is to it this freeing the mind by getting free of this delusion that there is a self and so really the only problem since it's all quite simple and straightforward the only real problem is whether or not you're interested do you care about this that's all that matters so please think about it carefully do you care are you interested in this or not we're we're sincerely asking you do you like a life that is without the positive and the negative at this point we've all invested a lot in the positive we've really got sucked in and deceived and tricked by the positive and this makes it very difficult for us to study and investigate that which is neither positive nor negative and so for to na- therefore to enable us to to investigate this matter without undue difficulty we need to really become interested in that which is neither positive nor negative if we're sincerely interested in this our spiritual practice will not be difficult so look at this matter very carefully give it your fullest attention if we genuinely like this if we're interested then we'll we will be able to discover a life that is no longer trapped by the positive and negative this will be a life that is freed of that self illusion and so that life that mind will be peaceful will be calm will be cool which is the highest benefit for that mind itself and in such a mind which is no longer deluded and trapped by positive and negative by i and mind that mind will be completely unselfish a mind that is unselfish is able to genuinely do things for others whenever we're selfish our acts are of no value to others and often often cause outright harm but when we are unselfish we can do things which are of genuine benefit to others and so in this way the the unselfish mind the mind that is free of self of positive and negative is of benefit and value for everyone for both oneself and for others this mind that is unselfish is the mind that is of benefit for all if you can understand this then we think you'll you'll genuinely like it when we look around at our fellow human beings we take a 
a look at this world, we see that all people are trapped within this thing called self. That people are, are full of selfishness, completely deceived by the positive and the negative. And we see this causing all kinds of problems and conflicts and wars, all this selfishness in self. So the question for us is, do we dare? Do, do each of us have the courage to step away from all that ego and all that selfishness and all that violence in order to find genuine happiness in peace? Do we have the courage to back away from all that selfishness in order to free ourselves of, of I and mine, of ego and selfishness? If we do, then we will ourselves experience true happiness. And we will also be able to, to bring peace to the world. All that selfishness can never bring any peace. Only if we have the courage to free ourselves of selfishness, only in this way can we hope to bring peace to the world. So do we have the courage to do this, to do something that is of the highest benefit for ourselves and for others? Do we have this courage to get free of positive and negative, of I and of mine. If we have the courage, anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, provides the means for us to do so. If we practice diligently, sincerely, correctly, then this will give us a way to get, get free of this selfhood and all the tremendous problems it's causing for the world and for each of us, even as we sit here today. So this is the question facing each of us. Do we have the courage to practice, to be free of self? Are we really willing to do something for the benefit of not only ourselves but of the world? This is all there is to it. This is the big question of our lives. And so we, we leave it to you to think about it. Today's talk is over.